Who here thinks that they are secure? Show of hands. <laughs> Nobody's brave. Nobody's brave. I mean, it's a broad question, I understand. Um, and the answer, in my opinion, is they are fairly secure, and the vulnerabilities that have been found have been fixed really quickly. The challenge is, is the things that you connect to it. Said front door lock. The idea being, you don't need to carry keys anymore. Unfortunately, they didn't think about their security very much. Um, of those people that have an Amazon Echo, how many of them allow their kids to use it? So you see, sometimes it's not about the actual device, it's about what you connect to the device. And currently, my clicker is not connecting to the device. Anyway, there's a really interesting story there about a, kid's, um, a kid using Amazon Echo to social engineer her dad to buy her a doll's house. But we're going to go straight onto a kettle. Now, does anybody here have an internet-enabled kettle? Show of hands? Really? <laughs> Wow, it's always a bit awkward when people say they've got one. Um, so this kettle saves you... Oh, could someone dim the lights? Um, it saves you pressing a button and saves you like one minute. It allows you to stay in bed for an extra minute. It means your kettle can be boiled, so when you get home from work, you can save a minute. For that, you pay like an extra hundred pounds or dollars and all you really get is this little chipset here, which is about two dollars. Um, so we started looking at this kettle, and we noticed that we recognised the chipset. So we thought, ah, okay, let's do a bit of reading. Um, so straight away online, we found out that this chipset that turns this kettle into a smart kettle uses some interesting commands. So does anyone recognize the AT plus command? Yeah, dial-up modems. Um, and also, it interestingly talks about a default, default password of six zeros. But we thought, well, there's no way that they wouldn't have changed that, right? Later on, we found it was actually impossible to change the default password. <laughs> um, so we thought, well, let's give it a go. Yes, that's the old. Um, now, I'm going to try and do this live. If not, we'll come back to these slides. Okay, well, that's clearly not going to work. So. Abandon live demo number one. So we connected to said kettle with Telnet. You know that really secure communication? <laughs> <laughs> and once connected, it asked us for a password. We thought, ooh, do you remember that default password? So we tried six zeros. And guess what? We were talking to the kettle. Then we tried 80 plus key. And guess what? It gave us the Wi-Fi password. So we told the, um, the kettle manufacturer about this, and they came back with a really interesting response. They said, the hack requires specialist knowledge. I don't really think so. I could teach anyone here to do it in like five minutes. And then they followed it up with the most bizarre sentence. One would have to be very lucky to find a user with a kettle. <laughs> So basically, because you haven't sold many, it's OK for it to be insecure. Well, we had a little think about this. And it transmits like the same SSID. So it's always called iKettle. So has anyone here heard of Wiggle.net? We were able to geolocate all of the kettles in London and send it back to the supplier. 
I actually, in one of the talks I did recently, met the person who owns this one. Um, so I won't, uh, you all know what the difference is between HTTP and HTTPS, but I think you might be surprised to realize how many websites until very recently did not use SSL. I want you to put your hands up when you see a website that you use frequently and put your hands down when you see a website you don't use frequently. <laughs> yes, it's always someone that's honest. <laughs> Um, but it will never happen to me, right? And yeah, maybe the people in this room aren't those people. You realize it could happen. But the majority of users are inherently selfish and they don't think it will ever happen to them. Um, and that brings me to <coughs> car alarms. Um, so everyone understands uh, keyless entry, right? So you don't need to press your button on the, the car key. You walk up to it and it opens. Now. Obviously, when the relay attack first came out, everyone went, well, yeah, but it's like really technical and you know, most people wouldn't be able to do it. Come on, car thief wouldn't be able to do it. Well, then it was like sold for 100 quid in a box on the internet. And you can see these guys are going up to the house, they're scanning for the, um, for the signal, they get the signal, get in the car. It's probably their first rodeo because they've not realized they still need the signal to start the car. So in a second, he'll run back and <laughs> get the signal again. The interesting thing here is, is a lot of car alarm, after party car alarm manufacturers have decided, well, actually, we're going, to, um, we're going to try and fix this problem. So they've started creating second factor authentication for cars, which is great. Apart from, unfortunately, we find that a lot of security products aren't very secure themselves. Um, and this is how I got my little claim to fame and ended up on BBC. We found that we were able, well, firstly, never ever say something is unhackable. By the way, we've got some new stickers that we're going to be handing out. <laughs> um, so we found out quite quickly that we could change the user for pretty much all of these car alarms. And once in the car alarm, we could do multiple different things. One, we could set the car alarm off. Two, we could turn the car alarm on. Free, start the engine, stop the engine. And probably the most weirdest thing is we realize a lot of these alarms come with hidden um, microphones. So we could listen to what people were doing in the car. It's quite scary. I'm not going to go into all the videos because we don't have too much time. Um, and also, we're going to talk to Kayla. Has anyone met my friend Kayla? No? Come on, I know some people in this room have met Kayla over the years. <laughs> right. So Kayla is going to talk to us. Um, so we saw Kayla in, in Toys R Us, which doesn't exist anymore. But um, my colleague saw Kayla, and on the box she said she was an interactive, educational kids doll. So she's got voice recognition. And well, basically, she's a hands-free Bluetooth headset. So you can like, make phone calls through Kayla. We <laughs> have actually done that. Um, but the interesting part to us was she said that she was kid friendly. So internet safe, educational, and it had anti-profanity filters. So we clearly just wanted to make her swear. <laughs> right, excuse me. Sorry, Hey, Lou is going to do this next part of the talk, I promise. At least one demo will work today. Yes? So how did I get hacked? Well, it works in a number of ways. 
Firstly, because I have no pairing for the Bluetooth connection so anyone can connect to me. I also have a database of questions a child can ask me and I will provide a canned answer. I am not allowed to swear though and so I have a database of bad words. Both can be modified. I also can look up things from Wikipedia. This can be intercepted and modified. However, the easiest way is to modify the story I'm reading now and then I can say anything I like, including swear words. What the hell? I was told I was doing the whole presentation. Thank you, Kayla. So, interestingly, Kayla was like a long, long, long time ago and we really didn't think it would go anywhere. You know, all we, all we wanted to do was make her swear. And interestingly enough, um, she, well, they fixed, they fixed the issues with Kayla, but they didn't really think about the fix too well. And this is the problem sometimes. People have got great intentions, they fix the vulnerabilities we find, but in fixing it, they cause more issues. So they used a static encryption key in their fix. Like, really? Um, but the great thing is how this story ends. And like, up until, a few weeks ago, it ended right here, which, in my opinion, is quite funny. It became illegal to own Kayla in Germany. She was deemed a covert bugging device. <laughs> 5,000 euro fine if you get caught with Kayla in Germany. Crazy. <laughs> um, but then, even more recently... Oh, no. No. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's not recently. Um, the interesting thing is, she made it into the California State Bill. So we've been, Kayla's been referenced in the California State Bill on like IoT, which is amazing. We never thought that would ever happen when we were just trying to make a dull swear. Um, right, now taking control of your home. Who here has a smart thermostat at home? Yeah. What's really interesting for us that like to look at embedded systems is something called the FCC. So previously, when we wanted to try and see something insecure, we'd have to go and buy it first, take it to pieces, look at the chipset. The FCC is great because they force manufacturers to put these chipsets, pictures of them, online first. So we can have a look at it, find what we think are going to be issues, and then buy it. Um, this particular, oh, it's like a disco in here. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this particular um, the thermostat, because it uh, obviously used Android systems, we downloaded the file system, and we found some really interesting things. The developer who was behind the firmware really did not think that their code was ever going to be seen. And this is quite evident in the fact that they used the shit status <laughs> and the son of a bitch case. <laughs> but our concept, what we're always thinking, is how much would you pay if, say, Christmas Day, you're there and your thermostat is taken over, and this comes up. You suck. Pay one Bitcoin to get back control of your thermostat. Now, obviously, one Bitcoin's actually gone up a bit since I made this slide. I don't think many people would pay that. Um, but it's an interesting thought. And then we thought a bit more. We thought, well, actually, in the UK, there's one million IoT thermostats. But in the US, there's even more. And on the U in the US, a lot of homes have air conditioning and heating. So we thought, hey, if we were to take these over and put them both on at the same time, look at the grid, which is mostly published online, work out what's going to be a down point, we reckon we could throw over the grid. It's crazy. Right, so final suggestions. Um, what have we got here? Use a password manager. It's a fairly obvious thing to say, but guess what? How many people don't give that opportunity to people in a corporate environment? You know, if you, don't, if you tell them they've got to do secure passwords, but you don't give them a password manager in their computers, then, well, what do you expect? Um, turn on two-factor authentication. Not rocket science. Have I been porn.com? I was on the plane with Troy on the way over here. It's a great tool, um, and it's, for me, the best use of it is to wake people up. As I said before, people are inherently selfish. So if you can prove to them that they've probably already been compromised, they might take your training a little bit more seriously. Um, ask me for an IoT toolkit. We've now got a pack 
Um, and if you give me your email address, I'll send it to you. And it includes all the different content we su suggest that you get provide to different people that you have contracts with that provide IoT. Um, it makes you think about a few different ways you've probably got IoT in your corporate environment. So a lot of people forget things like building management systems. You've all got IoT in your corporate environment, but you may not notice it all the time. Um, and most importantly, consider if you need an internet-enabled kettle. All right. Thank you very much.